the Boston Celtics lost in Game 7 to the Miami Heat and therefore are missing out on the NBA Finals. And because of that, there is going to be some tension and some drama, especially around a certain player named Jalen Brown. I'm sure you guys know him. Welcome everyone back to Utility Sports. Really excited for this video where we talk about Jalen Brown and his potential future with the Boston Celtics. Personally, I have very strong feelings about this, but I think it's a topic that's going to be very prevalent over the next 24 to 48 hours specifically. So I definitely thought I should make a video on it, address kind of the rumors we're going to hear and give my own thoughts on the situation that we're going to see likely transpire between Jalen Brown and the Boston Celtics this off season. If you guys are new to utility sports, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content. And without further ado, Let's jump into the video here. And I want to start with a disclaimer. If I was Brad Stevens and if I'm in the Boston Celtics organization, I am firmly taking the position that I would not trade Jalen Brown. He's an all NBA player at 26 years old, right in the heart of his prime about to enter it. And he's a wing. He plays a premium position. He's got great size at about six foot six. He's pretty much everything you're looking for in today's modern NBA in terms of somebody who can knock down perimeter shots, drive the basketball. You'd like to see the playmaking a little bit better, but I mean, he's an all NBA guy. You can't really find guys like that very frequently. Those players are really hard to replace, especially when they're 26 years old. Some people are going to point to the Pascal Siakam situation. I feel like this is completely different. He's four years younger and he's on a better team that has his bird rights. It's just a completely different situation. And if you look at the team's track record since drafting him, well, they've either made it to the Eastern Conference Finals or advanced past it five of the seven years he's been in the league. And they've made the playoffs every single season that Jalen Brown's been in the league as well. Remember, they drafted him third overall out of Cal. Then from there, they lost in the Eastern Conference Finals, again lost in the Eastern Conference Finals, lost in the second round, lost in the Eastern Conference Finals. 2021, they lost to the Nets in the first round. Then the following year with Ime Udoka, they lost in the finals. And then in 2023, they lost in the Eastern Conference Finals. And I know some people are going to say, well, they haven't gotten the job done. That's a pretty well done job. You know how many teams would love to make it to five conference finals in a seven year stretch? All of them. Every single team in the league would love to do that. It's very, very tough to do. And Jalen Brown, yes, I know early on maybe wasn't the most impactful player on, say, that 2017 team, but he's the second best player on the team right now that just made it to the conference finals and lost in seven games. They legitimately have a shot at winning the title pretty much every single year. It feels like so I, I just don't think trading him is smart. It's going to be very difficult to find somebody at his level at his caliber. And by the way, he's essentially the same age as Jason Tatum. He's one year older than him. You literally have your second best player and his age lined up perfectly with your best player. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And you can see on Fanspo, which is a really fun uh, website to use, especially for the trade machine. Jalen Brown's the second most traded player right now on the website. He is second trending only behind Anthony Simons, who's probably currently being mock traded to Toronto for Pascal Siakam and to Boston for Jalen Brown. And we'll talk about a potential option like that in this video. Real quick, I have 10 trades in this video. And I would assume that if there was a trade to go down around Jalen Brown, that there would be an extension in place, whether that's a handshake, wink, wink agreement or an actual extension that is ironed out and signed. OK, so you're going to see, oh, he's got one year left, this, that and the other thing. OK, if a team's trading for him, they, they're confident they're going to have him long term. OK, so you just have to kind of assume that going in. And again, my whole premise on this video is I would not trade Jalen Brown if I was the Boston Celtics and Celtics fans are going to probably see why as we go through this. So let's start with a homecoming for Jalen Brown, who is from Marietta, Georgia, and Hawks fans really would love to see him back in Georgia, this time representing the ATL for the Atlanta Hawks. And this trade, I mean, you're going to see all the reasons why Boston should not trade Jalen Brown, an all NBA guy in the heart of his prime. You're going to trade him plus Danilo Gallinari's contract and Peyton Pritchard's contract to bring in what? Here you get DeAndre Hunter, okay, former top five pick. Maybe there's some intrigue, averaged about 15 points a game this year. You're going to get A.J. Griffin, just outside the lottery pick last year. Pretty nice player. He can shoot the basketball and, and did a lot of nice things for Atlanta. Hit a game winner this year as well. You're getting Bogdan Bogdanovich, who just signed an extension with the organization there in Atlanta. Again, a pretty good player. And you're getting Bruno Fernando, a kind of young big. That, yeah, I mean, it's whatever. He's in there for the money to make it work, okay? 
From there, you're also getting this year's first round pick, which is pick number 15. You're getting a 2024 first with all of the backups that it has from Sacramento. And then you're getting a 2029 unprotected first from the Atlanta Hawks. And if you're Boston, you might say, oh, that's pretty good value in terms of young players and, and guys who can contribute right now as well with Bogdanovich. And again, you might say, look, we're getting three real rotation players. Hunter, Griffin, and Bogdanovich can all play. And we're getting three first round picks. And yet you still feel like you're losing the trade. This is why you can't trade him. Okay, this is this is why. This is a, a mammoth offer from Atlanta. And Hawks fans are going to be saying, whoa, we're not offering all of that. Yeah, you'd have to, okay? A.J. Griffin, DeAndre Hunter, Bogdan Bogdanovich have all combined for zero all-star appearances, okay? Jalen Brown is all NBA. There are levels to these things. He is significantly better than all of those individual players. And for a team like Atlanta, they would be better with Jalen Brown. They would be, and I think Boston would be worse because Boston doesn't really need as much depth. Boston needs high-end players. And the honest truth, I know people are going to overreact to the way that the Heat series ended. Jalen Brown did not play well in the Heat series. I completely understand. And some of the deficiencies that he's had throughout his career, I think reared their ugly heads in that series. But you just can't cut ties with a guy because of one series or just a couple instances. I mean, the guy 82 games a year is fantastic. And you just can't afford to just give him up and think, oh, well, DeAndre Hunter is our blue chip we're getting back. I just, you can't sell me on it. You really can't. This is a strong offer. This is a lot to give up for a single player. And I still feel like Boston's losing this trade pretty handedly because Jalen Brown's just significantly better than all of these other guys. Now, Hunter, Griffin, Bogdanovich, would they fit really well in Boston? 100% they would. It would help the team in terms of, yes, their depth would probably be improved. You wouldn't have Peyton Pritchard playing at all anymore. Grant Williams is likely going to leave in free agency, which, like, it opens up some things, right, for Boston. You probably need one or two role players at least. So a kind of one for three type of trade, yes, it does help their depth, but depth isn't what's going to completely change the series for the Boston Celtics against the Miami Heat, okay? It just isn't. Jalen Brown averaged 22 points a game in the playoffs, around 48% from the field and about 35% from three. He had a very good postseason for himself, even with the terrible conference finals. I think Atlanta Hawks fans saw how good Jalen Brown was in round one, okay? This is not, this. It just, I can't rationalize making a trade like this which is part of the issue. And then going into trade number two, well, here at least you're making a deal with the Knicks, which I think if Boston were to consider trading Jalen Brown, they would like to trade him to the West and not keep him in the Eastern Conference. But this is, again, another relatively strong offer. You're getting R.J. Barrett, who did put up pretty good traditional counting stat numbers this year. Obi Toppin, a, a young guy that I really like as a player i think he's got a lot of upside still uh, athletically of course off the charts but then you also think about the skill set he can handle the ball a little bit for a four man uh, he's really worked on his shooting and i think uh, overall he's just really progressed as a nice player even though sometimes the minutes and the encore production hasn't really backed that i think he is just a flat out good player you're also getting four first round picks here from the new york knicks this is a really strong offer again you're getting a guy who's a former number three overall pick another former top 10 pick you're getting on top of that, four first-round picks, some of them from pretty advantageous situations, Dallas, Detroit, for example. And yet, it just doesn't feel like you're getting enough. The Knicks, this would feel like highway robbery for them. This is why they've been stacking up those assets. They want a deal that would materialize somewhat similar to this Jalen Brown type of trade. But again, if you're the Celtics, does this trade make you better? And does it make you better specifically around Jason Tatum and the answer to that is no even if RJ Barrett is a ends up taking another step forward as a young player and Obi Toppin takes a big step forward does this make the Celtics better long term and the answer to that for me is no I would rather just commit to Jalen Brown on an all NBA contract and give him the super max I know yes it's gonna kind of change some of the team building elements there's a lot of reasons as to why maybe it becomes harder for Boston to I don't know make it to the conference finals every year but the reality is with the team that they've built they've made it to the conference finals literally almost every single year and until Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum prove that they can't win a lot of regular season games and make deep runs in the playoffs even if that doesn't mean winning a title every single year it's still worth having that over RJ Barrett and Obi Toppin. Okay, and I love Obi Toppin specifically. I think RJ Barrett's a fine player, and it's always good having draft picks. But that doesn't move the needle for you in May. Draft picks do not win you games in May. 
They win you games in future Mays, possibly, but I feel pretty good about Jalen Brown's ability to win games in May. Uh, and for the most part, he has throughout his career, as we evidenced earlier on. Trade number three, here's one with the Indiana Pacers. Jalen Brown goes to Indian, Indiana to play with Tyrese Halliburton. Pretty good fit, honestly. Uh, one that would be a lot of fun to watch. And the Celtics, this is an intriguing offer because they get a former first round pick in Isaiah Jackson, a former top 10 pick in Jalen Smith. Again, not really great players. That's significantly lesser compensation than what we got for uh, in the RJ Barrett and Obi Toppin package. But what they are getting is pick seven in this year's draft, pick 26 and pick 29, as well as an unprotected first next year from Indiana. So four first round picks, two young bigs, and then also some money fillers in there in TJ McConnell, McConnell and Daniel Tice. My assumption is you could reroute McConnell somewhere and um, save yourself some money off the tax if you wanted to, and then also maybe get a couple second round picks for him because he is still a pretty solid backup point guard. And if you're Boston, yeah, Taylor Hendricks could definitely help you, or maybe Jarris Walker. Maybe, just maybe, Cam Whitmore falls to you, but I would be kind of surprised by that. So you're sitting there at seven. You get a guy who can be a nice impact player for you. Maybe the eventual Al Horford replacement long-term into the starting lineup is what Taylor Hendricks would likely become there in Boston. Flat out a very good player. I like Taylor Hendricks a lot. I'm very high on him. He possibly ends up top five on my big board this year. But at the end of the day, you're trading Jalen Brown for Taylor Hendricks and other stuff and i just again you can't rationalize this and indiana fans are probably going to be thinking whoa that's a lot to give up not for an all nba guy it's not you think about all nba players to be traded in their prime first of all that list is very few and far between and then secondly when it is it's all the picks all the swaps all the stuff you think about what james harden got traded for as you know obviously a former mvp in that deal jared allen karis levert all the picks all the swaps everything went out the door for him right this is kind of a discount for indiana and it feels like a lot to give up but it doesn't even scratch the surface for boston but how can indiana really give up more and that's the real tough issue here is if boston's moving jalen brown because they feel like oh in may he's not going to win us a title in june he's not going to win us a title then why would the pacers even give up everything for him and that's really what doesn't make any sense jalen brown should not get traded and, you know, I, I've been seeing it all over the place. I'm just not, I'm not down for it. I don't think that that should actually happen this year. Trade number four. Here's one that's going to be floated around a lot. As you previously saw, the Trailblazers acquired Jalen Brown for, and I think this is one of the stronger packages, pick number three in this draft. A lot of people like to deem this draft as a three-player draft. I don't personally believe that myself. I think there's a lot of really high-impact players. Uh, so I wouldn't call it a three-player draft. I think it's a 58-player draft because there's going to be 58 players drafted. Uh, and I think that you can find talent at any at any pick in the draft. That should be evidenced by Nicole Jokic being a second-round pick and a whole bunch of other guys being non-lottery selections. But number three is better than number four. And number three is better than number five and so on and so forth because you'd just rather pick earlier. It gives you your selection of the whole field at the earlier spot. That's what you want. And here in this draft, that could probably present you Brandon Miller, potentially Scoot Henderson, but likely Brandon Miller. And on top of it, you get Anthony Simons, Nasir Little gets added into the mix, and Trenton Watford. It's pretty much a perfect dollar for dollar swap here. Only $300,000 separating the two sides in terms of the deal. And on top of that, you also get pick 23 in this year's draft. Portland, this is a, a perfect scenario for them because at pick three, you're probably likely drafting Brandon Miller, and your hope is that Brandon Miller turns into a Jalen Brown level player. I've previously compared him to maybe a Brandon Ingram level player as kind of the ceiling that he could get to. This is a home run for Portland because you're telling Dame, look, we want to win with you. We're, we're committing to winning with you, and we're getting you this proven player. But realistically, the proven player is not 30 years old like Pascal Siakam. He's 26 years old. So you'd feel really good about signing him to a five or six year deal, tying him to the franchise, um, you know, six year deal, like a five year extension is what I'm saying. And, and he's tied to the organization for six total years, um, tying him to the organization through like age 32 or age 33. Because that makes a lot of sense when it's Jalen Brown. It doesn't make sense to give Pascal Siakam a five-year extension because then you're tying him to the organization through 36 and you're setting yourself up for long-term heartbreak. And for Boston, I mean, this is a stronger offer because you can have actual tangible evidence of this is the player we're replacing Jalen Brown with in Brandon Miller. 
and you can maybe talk yourself into that a little bit more because it is a top three pick and that's where Jalen Brown was selected. That's where Jason Tatum was selected. So maybe can you strike gold again? The issue is right now, Jason Tatum and this team is ready to compete and win, win a title. They've been so close. They've knocked on the door. We're in the finals last year. Game seven of the Eastern Conference Finals this year. They just haven't gotten the job done. So do you really want to move off of that and bring in some young, unproven players, Nasir Little, Anthony Simons? I mean, these guys haven't proven a ton in the NBA when it comes to winning. Now, Anthony Simons is a very skilled player. I think Nasir Little could fit in the right situation. I like Trenton Watford personally myself too. But does this make Boston better in May? And does this make Boston better in June? And that's the question you have to actually ask yourself because the whole point of tra trading Jalen Brown is because you're under the belief that he's not going to win you a title. Like I said, are we sure that Brandon Miller and Anthony Simons are going to help contribute to that? The answer to that for me is no. And that's why I don't think that Boston should consider a Jalen Brown trade, even to the Portland Trailblazers for pick three. Going on to trade number five here. Now we have one with the Houston Rockets and they get four young players here. KJ Martin, very intriguing player, very athletic. He's on a team option, definitely will get picked up. Josh Christopher, former first round pick, hasn't really found his footing yet to this point in the league. Don't really look at him as too much of value in this deal. Usman Gruba and Tari Eason. Tari Eason is really the high value young player for me. And in addition to that, they get a 2023 first round pick, which happens to be pick number four in this draft, where I could see the Celtics go out and target Cam Whitmore, who if I had to give you a comparison, in the NBA for Cam Whitmore physically, what he could potentially become and grow into as a player. Very similar to Jalen Brown, especially for their draft profiles, where Cam Whitmore, physical slasher, could get to the rim, doesn't really make the right pass out of drives as often, but he's got all the physical tools to become a high-end wing in the league. Sounds very similar to the draft profile on uh, Jalen Brown when he was coming out. And in addition to that, you're also getting a 2025 first, for the rights of Jalen Brown. For the Houston Rockets, this is a home run because Jalen Brown, and you still have some cap space, you can go out and sign James Harden while still keeping your main young core intact and Alperen Shangun and, uh, of course, Jalen Green, Jabari Smith. You take a massive step forward and you have to point to the relationship with Ime Udoka as a main draw for Jalen Brown to stay with the Houston Rockets past the season and further and beyond this is, a, this is a home run trade for Houston. And for Boston, at least there's like that inkling of, hey, we have a clear plan of who's our successor for Jalen Brown, and that would be Cam Whitmore. To be honest with you, I feel just about as good of this trade as I do getting pick three from Portland, just because I think that Cam Whitmore potentially grows into a better player than Brandon Miller. Not that I'm 100% confident in that. I still have to finalize my big board and uh, move some stuff around. I'm still in the process of really giving my final rankings right now. Brandon Miller on my big board would be ahead of Cam Whitmore, but I, I don't think it's out of the question that Cam Whitmore maybe grows into a better player. So this is why for Boston, I, if you like Tari Eason a lot, like I do, you at least maybe listen to this one more than some of the other offers. But again, does this help you in May and June? That's what you have to ask yourself every time you're presenting a Jalen Brown trade. And the answer to that for me is a, re a resounding no, it just does not. So the Boston Celtics, I do not think can consider a deal like this. Let's go into Oklahoma City, and this is when things get really wild, okay? The Oklahoma City Thunder is the sole franchise in the league that could probably blow the doors off of Brad Stevens and say, wow, that's a big-time offer because they could really offer more than what they got for Paul George, possibly. Now, they're not going to give up that Shea Gilgis-type player, but they've got the money to match with Lujan Stort. They've got Alexei Pokashevsky, intriguing young big. Yeah, I'm not all in on Pokashevsky. I'm not a big Pokashevsky guy myself, but I do know that there's some buzz around him uh, in the league. Jeremiah Robinson Earl, he's in there. Just another body for an 82-game season. You're not going to count on him to be a playoff performer. Great man, intriguing young guard. Hasn't really flashed as frequently as people would have liked, but there's been moments. Usman Zhang, he's really the what can this guy grow into? What what could this guy blossom into becoming type player in this deal? He's the young player that I think Boston would have the most long-term interest in. He was just picked number 11 in this past draft. Uh, the Thunder actually moved up to draft him. And out of the NBL, he had a lot of intrigue about what he could possibly grow into as a on-ball creator, pick and roll ball handler, facilitator for others, and just a, a flat out shot maker with really good athletic profile. Boston would have some intrigue in Usman Jang, and then you're also looking at the fact that they're throwing in pick 12 in this year's draft and a, a collection of first-round picks, five others 
in this trade as well. So it's a total of six first round picks plus five players for Jalen Brown. Again, you're helping that Boston Celtics depth. You're helping uh, in terms of asset collection where Boston would then have six firsts from one trade, one of them being pick 12 this year where maybe they could look at a Grady Dick, a Case and Wallace. There's some really nice players out there that could definitely help Boston long-term. But is anything in this deal replacing Jalen Brown? And again, the answer to that for me is no. And I know I'm, I probably sound like I'm on repeat. It's because it's the most important question here. If you're going to tell me that the Boston Celtics should trade or will look into trading Jalen Brown, I need definitive answers on to who and how that actually makes them better. Because I'm telling you right now, Lou Dort, good player, does not make the Boston Celtics better. Pokashevsky, Usman Zhang, intriguing young players, does not make the Boston Celtics better in May and in June. And that's the entire point of this video. And people are going to point back to Kevin Durant. I'm telling you right now, this, this Boston Celtics team would not have won the finals with Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant's won two playoff series since leaving Golden State, okay? And one of them, James Harden, was on the team, and they beat the Boston Celtics. And the other one, Devin Booker, was arguably the best player in the series. So... You can't tell me that Kevin Durant was going to move the needle for the Celtics team. And you can't realistically even count on him being healthy night in, night out, which is something Jalen Brown is relatively good at is he's usually very available. And I think that's something you have to consider as well. When you're training a 26 year old star, would you want to trade him for a 34 year old star like Kevin Durant? And the answer to that for me would have also been no. So I just wouldn't have done that if I was Boston. And I feel like keeping Jalen Brown an all NBA level player should be a no-brainer, but people are going to be throwing out trade ideas. They're going to be talking about it a lot. Six first-round picks, really good. Really good. Not good enough, though. Going on to trade number seven. This one's with the Memphis Grizzlies. The Grizzlies and the Pelicans are going to be tied to pretty much every single wing that becomes available this offseason. And Jalen Brown, of course, is going to be the top-end option if he were to become available. So here I have the Grizzlies getting him and Danilo Gallinari. And to make the money work, the Celtics receive Luke Kennard. I do think his shooting would actually fit in pretty well with Joe Missoula's offense, which is basically chuck as many threes as possible. They also get Brandon Clark, who I think would actually really help them on the glass, give them another offensive rebounder, a really good screen setter. And hopefully from there, Boston could learn that, hey, we got to get downhill a little bit more and let Brandon Clark be kind of a, a lob finisher on some of those plays. And then you get three intriguing young forwards. Zaire Williams, who hasn't really proven a lot after being drafted in the lottery by Memphis, they actually traded up to get him. Uh, and it's funny enough, Trey Murphy was the uh, prospect that they basically traded the draft rights of uh, at pick 19. They traded up to get Zaire Williams and, of course, didn't work out very well for Memphis. He hasn't really proven a lot since his time in Stanford, which is why I included a Stanford jersey in this graphic. Then you look at Jake LaRavia, David Roddy, two former first-round picks from the 2022 NBA draft. Solid players. Okay, like this is a, a really good collection of current players right now for Memphis to give up. Kennard, Clark, Zaire Williams, LaRavia, Roddy, I would say all have either current roles or roles in the in the future. For sure, Boston, like, again, your depth gets significantly better here. You have a bunch of good players, and you get five first-round picks here because I, I do think if Memphis were to land Jalen Brown while keeping John Morant, while keeping Jaron Jackson, while keeping Desmond Bain, they probably become, if not the favorite in the West, probably second in command behind the Denver Nuggets. And there's a good argument that they would match up pretty decently because they have so much downhill athleticism with Brown and with uh, John Morant and Bain's got the shooting and Jaron Jackson can protect the rim for them, that maybe that would be a favorable matchup. I'm not saying it would be, but maybe. And it puts the Grizzlies really back into the heart of contention. And he fits the timeline pretty well. Jalen Brown is not much older than John Morant. He's not much older than Jaron Jackson Jr. And because of that, it's uh, a really good long-term fit and a really good long-term solution for Memphis if they're able to get it done. And it is worth all of these players, all of these picks. And again, I just if I'm Memphis, I would do it. And if I'm Boston, I would say, yeah, I don't know if Brandon Clark helps us enough. And I don't really know if Zaire Williams is going to be that good long-term. I know it looks like a lot. But you have to actually think which one of these players, which one of these assets replaces what Jalen Brown is for the Boston Celtics. And I don't really see it. The one that people might see a little bit more, I don't personally, but maybe some people will see it, is Trey Murphy, who is an ascending player. He finished the year very, very well for the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, and I've always been a high on him. Out of Virginia, he just he can really shoot the basketball. He's got the athletic profile to drive the rim and uh, finish above people. A lot of poster dunks this year. Trey Murphy's a fantastic young player. 
but is the ceiling Jalen Brown good? I'm not really sure. So you look at what they're giving up here, and this is a lot to give up. Okay, Trey Murphy, Dyson Daniels was top 10 pick last year. Kyra Lewis, former lottery pick, he hasn't really worked out in the league as much. You give up Larry Nance to make the money work, and Garrett Temple's in there for money purposes as well. And four first-round picks. Now, three of them come from Milwaukee. Because of that, you feel pretty good about what those assets are going to be. If you're New Orleans, you're not super worried because Giannis Antetokounmpo is under contract for a while here. So it's it's not likely that Milwaukee bottoms out. So giving up those picks, although it, yes, it does hurt. It limits your future flexibility. It's worth it because you're basically upgrading Trey Murphy currently into Jalen Brown, which is going from like kind of a good, young, intriguing young player to an all-NBA guy that's proven, uh, averages 20 plus points a game and has been an all-world type of player the last couple of seasons and has played very deep into the playoffs. This is a home run for New Orleans, a team that we haven't seen out of the first round in a long time since I believe beating the Blazers back when Rajon Rondo was still on the roster. They they need some stuff to go right for them. And Jalen Brown would significantly enhance this team. Uh, they also give up pick 14 in this draft to Boston. So for me, again, if I'm Boston, I say no to this, even though this is a very strong offer. Like, I, I hope you guys see all of these offers are really strong. There's a lot of good young players. There's a lot of good pieces, a lot of draft pick compensation. But every single time I see one, I say, okay, who's my Jalen Brown replacement? And it's really the, the difficulty of trading a star. You can trade a star. You can get all the right pieces, all the right young guys. And it doesn't really move the needle for you that much. And people are going to say, well, Jalen Brown struggled in the playoffs. Go look at the numbers. Okay. He didn't struggle in the playoffs. He struggled a little bit in the conference finals for sure. But remember last year, 2022 finals, people said that he outperformed Jason Tatum in the finals. So do you want to give up Tatum too? Or what's kind of the narrative there? That's the that's the real thing I need to know because you can go through all of these trades. It's just, I don't know. I, I don't know how Boston gets better by making these trades. I don't know how Boston's more likely to win a title after making a trade like this. I really just do not. Trade number nine. Now, this is a funky one, okay? Jalen Brown goes to the Minnesota Timberwolves, and Carl Anthony Towns goes back to the Boston Celtics. This is what you call a never-happening trade, probably. You see two All-NBA guys flipped for each other. Carl Anthony Towns, uh, former All-NBA third-team center. Jalen Brown, of course, former All-NBA guy. I've said that about 20 times in this video now. Jalen Brown, Peyton Pritchard go to Minnesota. This also solves Minnesota's backup point guard issue because Jordan McLaughlin is significantly worse than Peyton Pritchard, in my opinion. Uh, Jordan McLaughlin couldn't tell you what the color of the rim is. Peyton Pritchard can shoot the basketball. It's a, a night and day difference, honestly. And Jalen Brown, I think, fits better into Minnesota. Gives them another athletic wing threat. Would be really awesome next to Jaden McDaniels and Anthony Edwards and Rudy Gobert and Mike Conley. I think Jalen Brown's kind of what this team's missing. And for Boston... To be honest, I don't flat out. I don't like it. They get three second round picks here because even though Carl Anthony Towns is under contract for longer, I just think everyone in the league would really evaluate Jalen Brown as the better player, but not by a substantive amount. It's not like, a, oh, wow, well, well, they'd have to throw in like four first with this. But realistically, if I was Boston, that's probably what I would ask for from Minnesota because I just I'm not a cat guy myself. I don't like Carl Anthony Towns that much as a player. But I do think in the way that Boston plays kind of if he were to fulfill that Al Horford role next to Rob Williams could be a pretty intriguing fit. And Cat, when Boston wants to chuck up all the threes that they do, playing for Joe Missoula, Carl Anthony Towns is a perfect fit for that because he loves to stand on the perimeter. He loves to sit there and be super tall and not use his height to his advantage ever. And that's exactly what he could do in Boston, which is why I think, you know, first, Brad Stevens isn't going to consider this. Okay, this deal is not going to happen, but. Brad, Brad Stevens knows what he's doing. He's almost never lost a trade in his time as an executive because he's smart and he thinks things through and he has a good plan of action. He doesn't just react to, oh, well, this went terribly wrong in the conference finals. Now we got to trade our second best player. That's how people on Twitter talk. That's not how people in NBA front offices really think. And if Brad Stevens does act on that and he does trade Jalen Brown, he better get something really, really, really darn good because Carl Anthony Towns is not going to cut it. Okay, He hasn't won a playoff series in his career. And I don't see how he helps Boston win a playoff series. Even if you get extra assets and you get a couple young players thrown in like Wendell Moore, it, it doesn't move the needle for me personally. I think Minnesota would get so much better. I think Boston would lose some of its identity. And I think that they would just not be nearly as good of a team, uh, especially defensively. I think there'd be some real falling out from that. And our final trade, and this is what we call a Danny Ainge masterclass because he goes out and gets the player 
that he originally drafted in Boston in Jalen Brown. Of course, there's a relationship there. And the Utah Jazz cash in some of those assets that they have from Minnesota and Cleveland in this deal to land Jalen Brown via trade. And it's actually a sign and trade involving the Washington Wizards to get the money to work and to make this really make some sense. There's going to have to be some financial help from a third team. I opted to look at the Wizards here because it's very likely that they could potentially lose Kyle Kuzma for nothing this offseason. And if Boston is going to trade Jalen Brown, they'd want some type of wing coming back in, I would assume. Kyle Kuzma, one of the ones on the market that makes sense. I have him here signing a four-year, $124 million contract in a sign-and-trade landing him in Boston, where he would probably like to go to a team that's a title contender. Being in the postseason, I think, would be important for him while also getting paid. And since they're trying to match that money with Jalen Brown, definitely something we could see happen. And remember, Utah has done some work here before with sign-in trades and trying to work out some details on that. They did it last year in the Donovan Mitchell deal. Maybe they can work some magic here. Boston gets Simone, uh, Simone Fantecchio as well. Intriguing kind of young player, not really going to move the needle that much in my opinion but at least it's like a well let's see what he becomes right and then you also get four first round picks you get the first from the lakers that the jazz acquired this year you get a first this year two of them actually pick 16 and pick uh 27 i believe maybe not 27 maybe 28 i believe that 76ers pick is and then 2025 first as well from utah so four first round picks celtics probably say no to this one as well though i just don't think that this makes their team better washington would get colin sexton Taylor horton tucker a 2024 for, or uh 2024 second excuse me from boston and a 2023 second via portland so they get a couple extra assets and you might say well why would washington do this it's basically under the impression that kyle kuzma could potentially leave for nothing to a team with cap space this is their like sole way of recouping anything and they get a young guard in Colin Sexton who has splashed and Taylor Horton Tucker has had moments where he plays really good basketball too. So it's basically turning Kyle Kuzma into a couple guards that you want to at least give test runs to and see if, hey, maybe they can be six men for us or uh, fit into the rotation some way, somehow. And we get a couple second rounders with it. Again, I don't love this deal. I, like, I hope you guys notice how much I value Jalen Brown. There's there's not a lot of six foot six wings that are all nba caliber players growing on trees somewhere okay these guys don't come around very often he averages 20 plus points a game he's a rather efficient player most of the time yes he has some shortcomings but in the right system could he average 27 points a game as the number one option yeah he could okay maybe take more shots and he'd probably be a little less efficient and his team would probably lose more than they currently do but he could do it he really could do it and like right now, it's crazy to me that people probably value Damian Lillard as a trade asset more than they do Jalen Brown. Like that is just mind blowing to me because Jalen Brown is literally about to enter the heart of his prime and Damian Lillard is past his prime. It's just, it's mind blowing to me that there's even consideration about that. Jalen Brown should not be traded. And if he is, it should be for a heck of a lot, a heck of a lot. Thank you all so much for watching. I know this video was a lot of me saying Jalen Brown should not be traded that's the way that I feel about it. I did not want to make a trade video and say, oh, well, the hype's saying he's going to get traded. What did the Boston Celtics do? I just don't believe that. Okay, this video is very much inspired by me. I'm going to talk about it the way that I feel, and that's really the way that it should be. The Boston Celtics should not trade Jalen Brown. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. Let me know down in the comment section below what you think of a potential Jalen Brown trade. If you have any mock-ups that I did not talk about in this video, I would love to hear them down in the comment section or on Twitter. Go give us a follow over there. Again, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel for more, and we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.